Welcome to Amy. As one of Canada's preeminent centers of artificial intelligence, we thrive in our role bridging world-leading research and industry. Join us as we cultivate scientific excellence, develop talent, and coach businesses through AI adoption. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everyone. Uh, I'm Warren. I'm part of the team here at Amy. Uh, we're really excited to have a fantastic lineup uh, here today to share their experience with you. Um, I do want to mention we are testing out a new platform here for the first time. So um, as things go with virtual events, there's a good chance that uh, the wheels may fall off at some point. So feel free to uh, give us a note in the chat um, and let us know if uh, uh, if at any point you're you're unable to see or hear us, and we will uh, remedy that as quickly as we can. So we really appreciate your patience. And um, again, my name is Warren. I'm part of our talent team here at Amy. So we'll be working to bring you some really great content over the course of the year, um, different professional development opportunities where you can meet and learn from some of the, the best in the AI world. Uh, today, we have a fantastic panel that's excited to share their experience. And Noor and I, uh, Noor is, is our uh, executive producer behind the scenes today, um, we're faces that you'll likely bump into at some point in the, the coming months, uh, whether it's today after the session during networking um, or at future coffee socials and, and uh, virtual happy hour events and, and things like that as we transition into getting back to in-person activities here in, in Edmonton. So. Uh, I hope you have a chance to, to get to know us uh, early and often uh, in your journey here with Amy. And you can connect with us at any time uh, directly at talent at amy.ca as well. So don't hesitate to reach out uh, if you have any questions or are looking for some support uh, as you're getting started in your AI journey. Here's a quick little overview of what you can expect today. We have a few questions that we're going to go through together through a, a brief Slido activity. And uh, then we're going to jump into a short presentation uh, from Andy Patterson, uh, followed by our, our panel discussion. There will be time for Q&A, and you can add any questions you might have in along uh, the way, just in the, in the chat here in Remo. Um, then we're going to jump into a little bit of a kind of informal networking session to follow. So you have a chance to talk with some of the other attendees uh, and some of the presenters that will be sticking around. So there's a, a brief idea of what you can expect today. And now, uh, if you don't mind, you can actually just go directly to this URL. Uh, it's just sli.do. And here you'll be able to uh, follow along and answer a couple of quick questions with us in real time. Um, so that code to enter is just going to be paper review. Uh, we'll give everyone a quick moment to jump into that. And you should you should be able to see um, some kind of live uh, uh, data from the the submissions here as well. So we'll we'll share that with you. So our first question that we're going to go through uh, together, if you have uh, any uh, uh, experience that you want to share with us uh, to get started, um, we know that the AI paper review process uh, sometimes you know it goes very well, sometimes uh, not so much. And we're going to get to hear a lot about different people's experiences in, in, in that journey uh, today. But if you, uh, if you want to share one of your most memorable uh, rejection comments from a, a paper submission, uh, we'd love to see those uh, today. Uh, so uh, feel free to take a moment. And if you have uh, you know, one that stands out or one that's been keeping you up at night, maybe, uh, you can just throw those in here. Uh, we're hoping this gives everyone a, a bit of a, an understanding of you know, how normal it is to uh, to uh, maybe have some intense rejection from from time to time as well. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely liking some of these. <laughs> like that. Novelty is not enough. Uh, that's lovely. 
uh, this this uh, this will be open as well. If you if you think of something and you want to jump back to it, you can uh, you can add in anything that comes to mind uh, along the way throughout our conversation with our our panelists today as well. So really curious to know um, from the group here, what conferences have you submitted papers to before? Um, you can share any and all. We'll be able to see. Uh, there should be a good a good mix of. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I figured there'd be a few of those. Um, I think it'll likely create a word cloud for us here with the the different submissions. So, lots of AAA, AAA AI coming in. Awesome. I am certain that these conferences will be coming up in conversation at at some point with our our group today. So, this is a little bit of context for our our panelists as well to see kind of where the most of the the uh, submissions and experiences from from you all coming from. Awesome. That's great. We'll just leave that open for a quick moment. And again, you can come back to this if you, if you think of some other conferences that you'd like to share with us. Awesome. And just before we get started, love to get a sense of, you know, how familiar you are with the, the process overall. Um, what happens, you know, after a paper is submitted behind the scenes, how that, um, you know, insight or the, the, the feedback that you receive is put together. Um, we'll get a sense of what this looks like for everyone. So it's like there's a, a bit of a mix of, of experiences here. So that's, that's great. All right, a few of our panelists answering and uh, and showing a on the higher end maybe. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, we heard from many of you uh, along the way over the past year that um, this is a topic that was really uh, really useful to know about. Um, some of our more mature students were definitely talking about how. This is something that uh, you know. The more experience you have, the more you talk to mature students and professors about their experience, uh, it really helps you to level up your own uh, game and, and to put better submissions forward. So we were excited to uh, put together a, a a conversation today from some of our best uh, researchers who have all kinds of experience uh, in different conferences, uh, both on the uh, submitting papers and reviewing papers side of things, to come together and share their expertise. So. Um, thanks for sharing your answers with us to our, our quick questions there. And I'm going to pass it over to our moderator for today, uh, who's going to have a, a quick presentation about the paper review process overall, kind of set the stage for us before we jump into our panel. So I'm really excited to introduce uh, Andy Patterson. Andy has been a, a really great resource for us uh, as we've been getting started building all kinds of new resource packages and professional development sessions for our AI talent pipeline. So um, we'll just hand it over to Andy to uh, kick us off for today. There we yeah. go. Thanks, Warren. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and then I think my slides will show up in a second. There we go. Uh, yeah, so my goal today is mostly to talk very briefly, like 10 minutes or so, um, just to get us all on the same page about definitions and terms. Uh, based on this poll, it looks like a lot of people here are probably pretty familiar with definitions in terms of the review process. Um, but for the people who have not maybe reviewed a paper yet, they've only reviewed at a couple of conferences, I think it's useful to just kind of make sure uh, we're all calling the same thing by the same name. Um, I'm going to try to mostly keep opinions out of this uh, part of the talk and try to push all of those towards our, our panelists who are going to be experts in this area and can give us all of their hot takes in a few minutes. Um, but that said, one maybe slightly opinionated thing that is not generally broadly agreed upon is what is peer review and why do we do it? Um, but the answer that's generally true across all of our uh, conferences in machine learning is at least part of the answer is it's just to identify which papers uh, should be published at that conference. Um, There's definitely a primary tenant of peer review. And a big part of that is the number of submissions year over year is growing quite rapidly at a pace of like 40% increase year over year. This is at, uh, at NeurIPS. Um, and in 2020 at NeurIPS, about 10,000 papers were submitted. And so clearly going through 20, or, or 10,000 rather papers 
um, reading all of them, being insightful and, and clear and understanding which ones, which of the 20% you want to accept into the conference is a massive task. And historically that was done by the editors of a journal or the conference organizers, a group of five to 10 uh, experts in, in a field who are the ones that are driving forward the research and determining which paths uh, the research is going to take would be the ones that would take on this burden. But of course, at that point, 10,000 papers were not being submitted year over year. And now we've moved to a much more distributed process where we're going to have, say, three people um, on a paper who are going to read the paper carefully, give insights and opinions about the paper and determine, uh, give their recommendation about whether or not that paper should be accepted or rejected from that particular venue. Um, and these people collectively are called the reviewers, creative name. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be say three to five of them on a single paper for most of our conferences. They're also often called the programming committee. Technically that term refers to everybody in the entire review uh, process, but because the reviewers are such a massive body of the review process, um, multiple hundred of them at a conference like NeurIPS, um, programming committee is often used to refer just to the reviewers themselves. And they're going to submit their, their thoughtful reviews or single line reviews as it may be to a meta reviewer. Um, who's going to act as sort of the authoritarian judge who determines is this paper going to be accepted or rejected. Um, meta reviewer is sort of a conference agnostic term. Uh, they're called many different terms throughout different conferences, area chair, senior programming committee, depending on the conference, but meta reviewer is what we generally broadly call this class. Um, and uh, occasionally some conferences might even have an additional level of abstraction, the senior area chair, who is going to be in charge of a broader uh, group or broader community, like you might have a, a senior area chair or two for reinforcement learning and a few for deep learning and some for uh, learning theory, for instance. Um, and then finally, at the highest level, you have your program chairs, the conference organizers or the journal editors. Um, and they usually are not interacting or interfacing with individual reviewers or individual papers, but are rather uh, thinking a much higher level and calibrating a much higher level um, like our venue has room for roughly 2,000 presenters this year. Um, and so that is how many people um, we, we should be accepting at this conference. Okay, so the overall process um, starts with the reviewer invites. And that actually happens many months before uh, the actual review process itself begins. And I'm pretty certain that is because uh, they know that reviewers don't think very far in advance and so are willing to commit to something as long as it's early enough that they don't actually have to think about the consequences to having agreed to start reviewing for this conference, especially since reviewing happens right at the conference deadline when people are most stressed and least likely to agree. That's just my theory though. Uh, but then some time passes and then you get to your paper submission deadline um, and all the papers are in and now it's time to start bidding. And so as a reviewer, your responsibility is going to be to scan through the list of, of all of the papers submitted to the conference minus the ones you might have a conflict of interest for and to rank uh, say 20 to 100 of them in terms of your ability to review them and your desire to review them. If you look at a paper title and you say, oh, that sounds so dumb. Uh, maybe you don't want to uh, review that because you're obviously not going to be able to give an unbiased take. Um, but also you should consider whether you're going to be able to review it technically. You have the technical skills to understand uh, this paper. And the kind of information you will be presented with would be like the abstract and the title of the paper. Um, the Toronto paper matching uh, system is going to generate a score looking at your uh, past uh, publications and this particular submission and say, okay, this has X amount of relevance to you. There's also sometimes an affinity score, other metrics. Um, but I try to give you a sense of how close of a, of a match this paper is, and you'll be able to rank them or, or sort them by these rankings and then bid on which ones you actually want to ultimately review. And then behind the scenes, after you have done that and all of the reviewers have done this, there's going to be some black box optimization that matches reviewers to papers, roughly three reviewers to a paper and roughly three to six papers to a reviewer. Uh, and it's this huge optimization mess that's done automatically. And then there will also be time for some uh, manual intervention by the meta reviewers who also had to bid on papers at some point. Um, and they're going to start assigning reviewers, manually assigning uh, reviewers to papers if they can see like a clear match. Um, but at some point, all of this will finish and you will have some finalized review assignments and you will be receiving say three to six papers that you're going to write an insightful review on. Uh, and when that happens, you're going to be receiving the full paper submission, supplementary materials, the appendix, some code, maybe some data relevant to the paper. Um, 
And in the early stages, you're going to scan your paper quickly and say, oh, this has nothing to do with the abstract that I thought I had read. I'm not going to be able to review this. Communicate with your meta reviewer, and you'll see some minor adjustments as, as this happens across all of the papers um, in the conference. As reviewers start seeing their initial first takes at the paper, um, some things might move around a little bit. But after a couple of weeks, all of this uh, starts to settle down and you get into the meat of the review period, which is the review period itself, when you start reading uh, your papers, assigned papers, and actually writing your thoughtful reviews. Since that's the primary topic of the panel, I'm just going to skip over this part, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. But another really important part is the emergency review, which happens usually in the last week or two of the, of the bulk of the review process before reviews are sent out. And that's whenever something goes wrong. So for instance, someone, obviously not you as a reviewer, but one of your co-reviewers chooses not to submit a review, or there's really high variance where one person's like, I'm going to fight that this paper is accepted. Um, and someone else is like, these results are trivial and known or completely wrong uh, on a single paper. And so uh, the meta reviewer has no clear signal. They might choose to seek out uh, either an expert or someone they have leverage over, like a student, uh, somebody to come in and give a really short, quick, uh, sort of gut take on this is what I think of the paper. Clearly, this person is not going to have enough time to really sit through the proofs um, and carefully read all the background literature. And so hopefully they're going to be an expert or at least quite knowledgeable in the area or at least someone that the meta reviewer trusts to their opinion in this area. And they're going to come in and give a really quick review. After all of this has happened, this is when things start to get quite gray, depending on what conference uh, we're discussing. Um, each conference has fairly different procedures around the discussion phase, but in general, at some point, all the reviews will be made available to both the authors and the other reviewers. Um, and you'll start having some sort of discussion with the authors. Sometimes the authors are going to give you a single page PDF uh, that will respond to all of the comments made by all of the reviewers, which is obviously an impossible task. Uh, or sometimes the authors are going to have this open forum based discussion where they can bounce back and forth with the reviewers. Uh, which also naturally leads into the discussion period where in that forum based thing clearly the authors are going to be included um, but always for all the conferences that at least i have been a part of there's going to be some time set across set aside rather at the end where all of the reviewers can discuss privately among themselves and the meta reviewer um, and discuss each other's reviews uh, the author's responses any resulting discussion that might have happened before this point and this is a time where you really start butting heads with the other reviewers and start trying to come to a consensus, come to a total decision. Um, and during this uh, phase, your responsibility, your minimum responsibility is to at least acknowledge that you've read everything. State, I've read all of the other reviews, I've read the author responses, um, and I'm choosing to keep my score or change my score for these reasons. Also, during this time, the meta reviewer might reach out to you, ask follow up questions like, oh, you suggested that they add uh, Atari experiment, and I'm not really sure uh, what it is you think this might add. Could you clarify a little bit? Um, they also might start pushing for a consensus across the reviewers. Like, I see a six, a seven, a 10, and a one. Um, I have no idea what to do with this. I need to make one single decision. So I need you guys to discuss and come together and try to, to uh, see each other's side a little bit and come to a consensus. And at the end of the day, eventually a decision will be made um, and you'll get to see that meta review and what decision was made uh, usually a few weeks later. And before I close, I just wanted to mention a couple of key resources. Uh, so obviously this panel discussion coming up is going to be uh, really the only resource you're going to need for knowing how to review. In fact, I'd be shocked if there is anything we don't manage to cover in the 20 minutes. Um, but in the off chance that there is something more that you're going to need, uh, I really recommend going to a conference or journal specific recommendation. Uh, recommended site. Uh, for instance, ICLR is wonderful. ICLR has this huge uh, collection of resources available, blog posts. They have this really beautiful chart, flow chart, um, that if you're a reviewer, you follow the green boxes and you get to see what sort of decisions are happening, what process is happening around your major interaction points. Um, and they have a lot of other nice information. And so all of the major conferences and, and machine learning, at least that I'm, I've been a part of, uh, have their own take on review guidelines. Now, all of them are slightly different, um, and it's clear that each set of conference organizers sort of have their own opinions and takes on what review should be. So it's really valuable to go through some of these and just kind of read up on what other people think um, the review process should be, and really important that when you are going to review for a particular conference to understand what that conference uh, believes reviewers should be doing.
And then the last major resource I wanted to mention is we have a Slack channel, Learning to Review, in the Amy workspace. Uh, as long as you can reasonably anonymize your question and not give too many details about the, the paper itself that you're reviewing, it's a wonderful place to get some uh, more personalized feedback. Like, I'm in this particular situation, the paper did this weird thing, and I have no idea what to do. Um, and you can ask there. Uh, otherwise, I think I'm going to hand it back for, uh, for the panel. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and invite our panelists on stage, and I think Nora is going to start bringing everybody in. I'll note Warren had a little thing like, Andy, I'd recommend transitioning in this particular way that I noted or saw right as I was getting ready to end the slides. I was trying to, on the fly, insert that in. All right, cool. I think we have everyone. So the very first thing I thought would be reasonable to ask about, I'm not sure uh, that everybody knows uh, your history of peer review. Um, so what levels of peer review have each of you participated in? Um, and what is your just overall experience with peer review in the past on either side of the table as an author, as a reviewer? Um, we'll start with Lily since you have your mic unmuted. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, I've been a reviewer when I was PhD, just uh, uh, not much time after I published my first paper, then I got a review invitation for an article that was 2017 or 16. Um, and then over the time I've been reviewing for most of the conferences and uh, many journals uh, as a reviewer and also as a meta reviewer, but uh, I'm very junior. I haven't been a conference chair, uh, yeah, in my career. Yeah. And then going clockwise, as I see people, I don't know if everyone sees each other in the same order. Adam. Yeah. Um, I guess I've been reviewing for a while. I started in, in my master's um, reviewing papers with my advisor, Rich. Uh, and then in my PhD, I, I got more into reviewing on my own and, and did conferences and journal papers. And then I kind of ran the usual route of being a reviewer for all the major machine learning conferences. And then eventually now I'm sitting at area chair, meta reviewer for, for all the main conferences. And so I usually try to help out ICML, NeurIPS, and iClear every year. Um, and so I have a lot of visibility on what happens behind the scenes, how decisions are made, because, you know, we have to have to talk to the reviewers and then we have to talk to the people above us who make the final calls. So please ask me lots of questions. I've seen lots of different scenarios. And then Alana. Yeah, I'd say my uh, path was pretty similar. Um, maybe I would also add to it that I publish also in neuroscience venues. So um, I also do a lot of journal submissions, and I have also been on the editorial board for journals, so I can talk about that if there's interest. Awesome. And while we wait, I think there's about uh, like an eight-second delay between us and the people listening. So we wait for questions to come in. We had a list of a couple of questions that we put together um, sort of warming up. And so I touched just a little bit on the point of peer review is to figure out which papers are published. Um, but that's obviously kind of a hot take, and I'm really curious to hear your more nuanced takes. Um, what is the point of peer review? What should we be trying to do in peer review? And what should we be focusing on as we write our reviews? I muted without calling on someone. We'll start with uh, Adam. Easy question, correctness. Um, we should check if the papers are correct to the best of our ability. Um, Almost everything else is highly subjective and very, very difficult to do. And, and when you consider how broad the machine learning community is, um, deciding novelty, impact, um, contribution with people who work in robotics and theory and applied systems and algorithm development, you're going to get almost no census. And you just keep grabbing more reviewers and you'll get different answers. So if we all just focus on correctness, I think peer review would be a lot better. And I think that's something that everyone can can check, you know, as long as they have the right background. I would maybe add to that correctness, but also like um, at least not redundancy. So novelty, I think, is one thing that is hard to judge, but certainly you can say if things have been done before, and that's important to know. 
yeah, I quite agree that, uh, you know, uh, correctness and redundancy are the most important thing. But I guess the review process, I mean, the purpose of the review process is still to uh, find out the novel papers, the interesting papers to publish at the top tier value, uh, to distinguish them from just ordinary papers that don't uh, meet the level. But this is, again, very subjective and uh, sometimes it causes trouble as well in the review process. Yeah, as we even saw in the, the initial poll, novelty was brought up a handful of times, and it does seem really hard to actually identify novelty. Um, I know Adam mentioned, you know, correctness is the most important thing, and maybe we should uh, focus on the left, on the rest a little less because of how subjective it is. How do we identify novelty, and what happens if one of the other reviewers is just hounding on novelty, and you think this is a great paper, but they're saying, nope, too. I've seen this so many times before. This was trivial. I could have come up with this result myself. Uh, what do you do in that situation? I'll start with Lili. Oh, sure. So, yeah, so what I typically do is I read the paper and see if I learn something. Uh, if I can, you know, I read the title or actual introduction or the diagrams and the formulas, and I pretty know what the paper is about. <laughs> then I believe this paper is not that interesting. But uh, if I read the paper and I feel, oh, I cannot solve the problem, or uh, I read the introduction, I know that, oh, this can be solved, but I don't know the details. I am eager to learn the details. And uh, if I read through the uh, ex, you know, the methodology and experimental sections, I'm, um, it's satisfactory, the solution is satisfactory and performs good, then I think it's a pretty good paper. So basically comparing my own expectation on my own level, like, uh, did I learn something? Yeah. And then I guess the other side to it would be arguing for the novelty of your own paper. I'm not sure if you want to leave that for later. Did you want to talk about that later or would now be? Yeah, actually, that would be pretty interesting to talk about now. As an author, how do you respond to these sort of things? Well, I think we all have probably experienced the, like, this isn't novel, yet there is no reference to the paper that makes it not novel. <laughs> so that's frustrating, but, like, let's leave that aside. I mean, it really, the onus really is on the author to know what has been done and show how what you were doing is different. So um, when you have people who point related work that you missed, you should be happy to see it and you should, and then it is your job to make sure that you explain why what you've done is different because hopefully it's still different. I mean, um, you know, usually, usually you can find a way in which what you've done is different than what has come before, even if you weren't aware of it. I like to point out that there's two types of missing related work, right? Or at least two types. One is like, yeah, I missed some citations. It's, that's helpful to fill out the area. And the other one is like you're missing a baseline or someone already solved your problem. And that's kind of showstopper. And that's really important. You know, both are important. I would like to say one more thing about novelty coming from the author's side, which is often the discussion about novelty is because a reviewer is saying, this isn't novel or it's not a contribution because it's too simple. And reviewers often conflate those things. And, and you know, it, it does often, it happens more often with junior reviewers. And so when we're talking about novelty and impact and contribution, you know, when I started talking about we should look for correctness, I think correctness could be something that's checked by a large swath of reviewers. But I think people who are in the field for a long time know what contributions look like, have a better idea of what's going to have impact. And that's our job as, as senior researchers in the field. And they can, are in a better position to, to, um, to you know, make those kind of calls. But so when you're when you're the author and they're saying your work's not novel, usually I just respond with, I think you're confusing this with simplicity or or something else. And of course it's hopeless, but you know, I try to point it out. Uh, switching directions just a little bit. So when you start writing your review, especially as a reviewer, um, what is one of the first things you start with? Is there a general process you follow or like a format or template that you tend to follow? and then key things that you really look for in a paper um, and definitely comment on, and maybe key things that you definitely don't want to comment on on a paper. And I'll start with Alana. Good, yeah, I always, I feel like I have that writer's block when I get to the beginning of a review. I actually have one to write right now. And the way that I break that is that I write like a paragraph or two describing the paper. 
And that usually gets me sort of started and then I can sort of break into um, my, my uh, thoughts on the paper. I also, I try to go through a paper and, and mark up the PDF. And then the process of writing the review is sort of going through the PDF and trying to categorize all of the things that I found into groups so that it's not just like a stream of consciousness. Like these are all the things like in order as I saw them in your paper, because that's not really helpful. I also try to differentiate between what I would consider to be major comments and like minor like typos type of a thing or like unclear bits so that you can you know some of that stuff is easy to fix and I don't actually want you to give me a play-by-play -play on how you fix all my typos but I do also have like a bit of a personality where I have to share some of that stuff um, so I like to break it up and then I really think that process of trying to organize your thoughts into a coherent sort of story is really important and that's really part of the value out of a good review is um, putting the pieces together. I can jump in and uh, I always try to fight my biases when I when I review a paper. So I try as hard as I can to approach it looking for reasons to accept actually. Um, because reviewing just by its nature is kind of a negative process. Like you're critiquing something and you know that you have eight papers in your batch and you have to reject eight of them, probably. And so that's that's a tough place for a paper to start. And then the other thing is that it's usually not exactly in your area. And it's really hard to see the value in something that you are not personally working on. It's, it's easy to say, oh, that's 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 not what I'm interested in. And so I, I really try to go with a positive outlook on a paper. I have a very specific structure in my reviews that's been shared with the students at Unity before, and, and we could sh share it later in this thing. But generally, I, I, I try to be positive, and, uh, and I always try to write the review the next day after I read the paper. So I give a day in between to not be angry because you know the paper will eventually make me angry because they'll like do two runs and claim state of the art and all that stuff so i want to let that cool down and be more positive all right that's pretty interesting so i i would like to add a little bit about journal reviews or some rolling reviews that the nlp community is adopting in recent months i guess uh, in the past year uh where authors are expected to do the revisions so now when you review a paper, you need to distinguish some you know, drawbacks uh, that can be easily revised or some drawbacks that cannot be revised. For example, the paper lacks novelty. It's pretty, you know, something simple, doesn't seem to meet the bar of the value. Then, you know, even if you give a major revision, it cannot be revised. You know, if you change the model, change the thing, then it becomes a different paper. But sometimes missing a baseline, it may be a tough process, but uh, it can be revised and then the quality of the paper can be much improved. That's something like a major revision, but uh, sometimes it cannot be easily revised. So that's also something I would think of when reviewing a paper that uh, you know allows revision. But conference paper is like a gambling <laughs> after the other response. <laughs> they have some empty promises and then you either accept or not, then yeah. Yeah, and actually, I'm really glad you started touching on some of the differences between uh, conference submissions and and how that's reviewed versus journal papers, because um, the the process is rather starkly different. But I'm I'm guessing probably the way we write our reviews ultimately ends up relatively uh, the same. So I'm kind of curious. So I guess maybe there's there's three different things: workshops, conferences, and journals are some of the major places where we tend to submit our work. What are the differences when you review uh, between these and uh, having that knowledge of how you review those three different things, when do you choose when to submit to a workshop or a conference or a journal? Um, and we'll start with Lili. So um, how do I determine to submit uh, based on the my understanding of the value? For example, workshop is usually you know lower quality. And if you do something really simple, it doesn't work that really well, then you can submit sometimes negative results conference major, I mean, most of the papers in CS are submitted to conference. Journal, you can definitely submit to journal, but uh, uh, sometimes journal journal papers are extensions of conference papers. You can add like 30% more experiments or more text, more explanations, and then you can uh, resubmit it to a journal paper. When I review a paper, then of course I would uh, put the bar uh, as my understanding of the 
you know, conference or, you know, journal or workshop, usually workshop is easier. Uh, if it's correct, uh, almost correct, then maybe they lack baselines, then yeah, yeah, sure. But the conference, you have a higher bar. Journals, uh, it seems like journals are longer, so you somehow expect they have more experiments, especially if a paper is resubmitted from a conference or extended from a conference paper to a journal paper, I would check the uh, increment uh, from a conference paper to a journal paper. If they have, you know, very small uh, additional contribution, then there's no point to publish it twice. So I will check the uh, increment, how much more merit you have. Yeah. yeah, I would add to that that, like, um, I think of workshops as a good way to get feedback on your work. So if it's sort of an idea and you have some early like uh, experiments, a workshop can be a good place to get some feedback and some ideas of what to do next. It can also be a way that, to reach the people who will eventually review your papers. So the people who go to the workshops are probably the people who are the experts in the field. And they, so it might be a way to introduce them to your idea and also get some feedback that you might see, you might have seen later in a review had you not sent it to the, the workshop. And in neuroscience, conferences basically are workshops. And that's basically the attitude at those conferences is like, you're kind of shopping your work around and getting people's sort of, it's getting an impression of what people think of it so that you can do a better job of presenting it and sort of framing it when you go to actually publish it. Maybe one of the uh, slightly spicier questions coming from the audience, which is exciting. Um, how would you propose to fix or improve the overall review process, especially with conferences? And then one of the other questions from the audience, which feels like a natural follow-up to that is, Considering how bad reviews are at conferences, uh, should we be avoiding them and going straight to journals? And are things any better there? So a couple of questions, but I'm, I'm curious to hear you guys' takes. Uh, I'm going to start with Adam. Um, going to journals is a good idea. I'm doing that now, but now the journals are super backed up and slow. So yeah. Anyway, um, how to fix reviewing. I have lots of thoughts about this. So the first one was focus on correctness, tell the reviewers to focus on correctness. I think there's there's lots of problems with reviewing. Sometimes people just don't know it's important. As an AC, I get emails from people who are, you know, junior students and they're like, I'm gonna submit this a week later. Okay. I'm like, no, not okay. This was a hard deadline. And they they I don't know if they don't know or they don't care. I mean, it's definitely true that being a bad reviewer probably won't impact your career. Um, so, but I think the biggest problem with the reviewing system is the correctness thing and then also problems from the top. So bad reviewers are tough, but I've had lots of papers where, you know, I have four bad reviewers and I bring in extra reviewers. I discuss more with the SAC. I think I come to a good decision. But if you don't have ACs that are engaged and they just take the min score of the reviewers, the whole system kind of falls apart. And so the AC, the AC pool is actually pretty small. It's like couple hundred people maybe if, if it's a big conference. If we can't make this group, that group of people good, then how are we supposed to fix this whole system? And so my solution to this and something I'm working on right now is to try to get data on reviewing to, to show people, to show reviewers and to show ACs, you know, this is, this is like how many in, times you interact with discussion period. This is how long your reviews, reviews are. This is how often your decision d disagrees with the final call and then show those stats for the reviewer in the AC and then like the award-winning reviewers and the average reviewer, and then they can really calibrate. And you know, everyone's a reinforcement learning agent, right? So once they start getting data, we don't even need to tell them anything. They'll just start changing their behavior because they're gonna sit there and worry, oh no, someone's probably watching this and maybe they'll make decisions about it now. So I, I think that can help. And I'm, I'm working on setting that up for at least iClear. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And uh, I pretty much agree that uh, we somehow want to <laughs> keep the record of reviewers. Uh, but I think another thing is uh, we just have too many papers and we have too few reviewers or competent reviewers. So I guess some conferences adopt the summary rejection, which may be uh, uh, you know, some remedy for this the reviewing process because for experience, researchers, it may be easier uh, to just reject the paper by 
or you know easily skim the paper. So some papers are just crappy, you know, they have very short three papers, three pages, and then no experiments. <laughs> or you know, then I don't have to review it. I don't have to ask reviewers to review it. So I think those papers can be summarily rejected. Um yeah, so that's another thought from my side. I also think um <clears throat> incentivizing good reviews is kind of what Adam was talking about. And I think there have been ways like with the reviewer awards, which that has been attempted. I don't know how successful it has been. There's also been talk about um, paying reviewers in at least the journal uh, ecosphere, which I don't know if that'll happen, but. And I did want to say that I've, I feel like um, having been part of conferences that were run on open review versus other platforms, like just having open review, people being able to see the reviews after they're done and all of the conversation that goes along with it. I find that it's, I've seen some really great conversations in that uh, platform. I've seen papers get much better because of it, because it, and because there's sort of an extended period where people are actually having a discussion. I feel like it's, I feel like the reviewers have been more engaged, um, at least in the few snippets that I've had And I also think having the review form have some structure to it. It's not just like, here's a big blank box, put whatever you want, but actually having questions um, for people to put information and then scores along a particular, like more than one axis, not just like up down, but like other things like novelty, for example, also helps to um, get people thinking in the right direction. I know all of you have been area chairs, meta reviewers, in the past, is there anything as a meta reviewer that you've seen that's just like, please don't do this for the love of all, just stop doing this as a reviewer or things that you see as a reviewer, like, thank you for providing that for me. That makes my life so much easier. Uh, what sort of like the, the big things that get you either really excited in either direction? And maybe I, I saw you unmuted. I don't know if you had. Yeah. Yeah. I think the exciting thing is uh, detailed review and also discussion. So if you can uh, even just repeat your comment, you believe this is important after uh, you know, reading author res response or reading other reviews, you still insist that your review holds, then I think that's very important. For the don'ts, uh, I think the most embarrassing review is just a very dry and short and empty review. So I like it or I don't like it, then it's really hard to, uh, you know, understand what the reviewer thinks about. And uh, usually such reviews are discounted uh, in the you know, decision-making process. So yeah, I think just provide more details or provide your thought or reasoning. Yeah. I, I like when reviewers ask questions of the authors because it shows good faith, right? Um, I always tell my reviewers, because you know I see, I see this pattern over and over. They write a review uh, then they see the other three or four reviews and then the authors respond and then the reviewer tells me, I keep my score. I was like, wow, you predicted the future. You predicted what the other reviewers would, would pick out that was different than you and how the authors would respond and you, your score stayed the same. I mean, sure, sometimes your score stays the same, but so, you know, when, when reviewers ask questions, they're kind of admitting, this is my first pass, but this is an iterative process. and. I'm going to learn about this paper and refine my score and my understanding. And so when reviewers ask questions, I think it's, it's a really good sign. And of course, that has to be balanced with eventually they have to make a call, right? They, have, they can't just give the six. They have to actually decide, is this good or is this bad? And, and maybe less so than that, your decision isn't, is this good, is this bad? Your decision is, should we accept the paper as it was submitted this year, right? That's, that's what you're being asked to evaluate. And so people often give like essay scores to a paper. They're like, I'll give it a six because it was a pretty good essay. No, we're actually just asking you, should we accept this paper or not? And so it's, it's appropriate to, you know, go one, one way or the other from the middle. And so asking questions and then making a, a call is a really good sign for a strong reviewer. Yeah, I think just like engaging with the process is really important. And that includes engaging with the authors, but then at the end, engaging with the area chair so that they can write their meta review about it. Um, and at, as an area chair, I tried to summarize what I saw in the reviews and how people maybe disagreed and get people talking about the disagreements. So just like, 
just engaging. I mean, it's really the bare minimum, but you'd be surprised um, how, what a big difference it can make if you're willing to sort of reiterate your points and point out the things that you thought were the most important. And I mean, it's very helpful. Right, I think uh, reasoning is important. Right? It's not a decision, uh, yes or no, but uh, reasoning, why do you insist on your previous comments or uh, why your score is remain the same, but you provide reasons, that's pretty important. Maybe it looks like we have maybe about a minute left. And so uh, one major question that I have that's burning uh, is about confidence scores. I feel like this has always been a little bit of a thorn in my side, both as a reviewer and especially as an author. Um, uh, when, when you guys are reviewing, when you're area chairs, uh, even how much do confidence scores actually matter to you? How important is it that I, as a reviewer, really select the right score and reflect deeply on that? Is that something that's just going to, to appear in my written review? You're going to know just how much of an expert I am based on my review. Yeah, I'm curious to hear your opinions. Uh, so broad topic, confidence scores. It's like a bit of a personality test, right? It's like, would you put that you're an expert or not an expert? Like, what kind of person are you? So I think we kind of need to calibrate them by the person because depending on your own personal biases, you may or may not fill it in a particular way. But it is, I mean, I think it's nice to include because it can help you understand what they mean by their main score that they may have completely misunderstood then that's why the score is low or high. And they might not understand the context of a paper. And I think it's really helpful. Um, but I mean, like, don't agonize over it. Just like knee jerk reaction. Like, have you read any of the papers they referred to? Like, that's a good. <laughs> if the answer is no, then, ooh. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean your review is not useful. It just means that you may not be as familiar with the framing of the paper, which is fine. I mean, it's, people are going to read that paper who aren't familiar with the framing. So it's good to have all kinds of uh, that, uh, reviews. I, I guess they're replacing this with, you know, time spent reviewing and also the number of papers you've read or published in an area. Um, but I just want to say, one, I've never ever put full confidence on any paper I've reviewed. Um, so I guess that's the personality thing Alana was talking about. And as an AC, I've never ever looked at the confidence scores because I always infer it from the reviews. Right, I think it, it, the confidence score, confidence score helps to calibrate among different reviews, but the review quality itself is the better indicator of whether the reviewer understand the paper or not. But uh, as an author, sometimes you can argue back with the confidence score. So the reviewer gave a low score and also a low confidence score, but other reviewers have higher confidence scores with high scores that you probably have a better chance than, you know, vice versa. So, but uh, it's not, I mean, it's uh, some uh, auxiliary measures, but not the key point of uh, the review. I'm told we have time for just a little bit more and a couple more questions came in. Uh, so one of them was, as a reviewer, what are some of the red flags you see in submissions and how would you solve those? So is there anything that you see that's just immediately, that's a red flag and something I need to bring up in my uh, review or do such red flags tend to exist? Yeah, Adam. Three runs, right? So, you know, you have this new algorithm slash cobbled together system and then your main evidence of contribution is state-of-the-art results. And then I just go right to the end of the paper and look at the plots, see how many seeds they used, see how they dealt with hyperparameters and see what their error bars look like. And nine out of 10 papers, they fail one of those things. And for me, if the primary, the primary contribution is the new system, but the evidence of the contribution is often the experiment, not theory. And so if the evidence of the contribution is not at all statistically valid, then that's that's a hard place to move from. And again, I ask a question about it and ask them why they think it's appropriate, but it's it's hard to come back from there. I think the review depends on the paper quality itself. So if some papers are really crappy, right? They still have to do, I have reviewed some papers, they still have to do, delete this, right? So those are not ready and I wouldn't spend much time, just uh, maybe uh, a few minutes reading the paper and uh, uh, another, you know, maybe 10 minutes writing the review. It's not ready. The paper, like uh, two pages or three pages, 
But some papers, they seem to be very solid and they are difficult. They, they have some complications in the algorithms or theory or formulation, math, math formulations. Then we need to spend more time checking the correctness. If it's correct, then, you know, such a paper usually means ac accepted. Um, but some papers are borderline papers. Nothing is wrong, but whether it's interesting or not, it's questionable. Then, you know, we struggle a lot, uh, like determining whether, you know, this paper meets the bar or not. Then you look for other papers published. You look for other papers in the review of this cycle. Maybe you just get five and you just check like, is that a better paper among the papers you received or do you like the paper in general? So this is very subjective, but I think both ends, it would be much easier. Uh, and I guess I would say that I'm, I'm exhausted by the uh, sort of preoccupation with people making numbers go higher. It's like not, not, uh, it's a, I mean, there's some en engineering feats there and I think there's contributions there, but I'm also tired of it. Um, so I look for people having done the work of wh like, why is this important if you didn't make the number go up? Like what, what's the contribution and, and. You really, as an author, are the best person to make that argument. You, you understand the material deeply. And so if anybody's going to write a really good, you know, couple paragraphs about why this matters, it's you. And you should be the one to do that work. And if you haven't done it, then it's not done yet. And then one last question that came through was about what do you, what should you do with a bad faith reviewer, especially if you are a co-reviewer on a paper and and one of your co-reviewers is clearly in bad faith. So the paper shows a serious problem with an existing algorithm and that reviewer uh, happens to have work that builds extensively on that algorithm. And so therefore they exist, uh, insist rejection or you know, they've, they've written a uh, two sentence review, confidence five, score one. You know, what do you do in that situation as a, as a reviewer? What sort of power do you have there? Is this something that you think is going to just be picked up by the meta reviewer and it's fine? I say it's fine to point it out to the meta reviewer if you think that that's happening. I, mean, I think you can usually do that privately. Right, uh, but uh, I typically do just in the discussion. Uh, you definitely do it politely, uh, but uh, you need to provide reasoning once again. I don't. Uh, it's not a. Uh, it's it's not like I insist my score that's over. You know, then you know it's very hard for area chairs to. Uh, understand what happens, but you provide the reasoning. So the reviewer A believes something, however, it may be wrong because of something, and the author mentions something, then, you know, if you provide more reasoning, then it's more convincing. Um, as a meta reviewer, sometimes, you know, you can turn over the decisions by reviews, reviewers, especially the reviewers give high scores and you find significant problems, uh, it's easier to turn over. But if the paper is good, but the review scores are, you know, uniformly bad. It's very difficult to get it accepted. I believe uh, you probably need another round to find the uh, better, you know, reviewers or reviewers who understand the paper to get it accepted. But if the reviewers just give high scores, but there are obvious problems, it's easy to turn over. I just want to say something quick about this. When I was a reviewer, I always engaged in discussions and, and tried not to to give up. Um, and from a you know personal career perspective, I think that's a really good choice. Like a big part of research is networking, and, and a good way to get known by people in your community is to go, do a good job and to and to fight for what you believe in and make good arguments. And that area chair is going to notice that they're going to start remembering you. They'll pick you for other papers, and and I know it's it's hard, it's easy for me to say, but you know don't give in to the famous person that's arguing with you with a crappy argument. Right? Try to be polite, but try to hold your ground and not just say, oh. Well, this is Dale Sherman's, and you know, he thinks it's a bad paper, so I'll just agree with him. Don't do that. If you think he's wrong, tell him he's wrong. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, you can't reason a person out of a position they didn't reason themselves into in the first place. I feel like that applies pretty well right there. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for coming to our panel. I thought that was incredibly insightful. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Warren, uh, who's going to help us wrap things up before moving on to the, the lobby for our uh, social hour.
Thank you guys so much. Awesome. Wow. Uh, thank you so much to our, our panelists for sharing their insight today. I feel like we're just cracking the, the surface of all of that, that knowledge and experience. Uh, so we we're just truly thank you for, for sharing your, your time and, and knowledge with us today. Um, we will be putting together a bit of a resource package and answering some of the, the questions that we may not have got to today. So thanks again to everyone for such a, a great questions and, and such an awesome dialogue. Um, a few quick things before we wrap up. Um, we have a couple upcoming um, activities here. So if you haven't already, please come and join us. Uh, Adam was just talking about the importance of, of networking, talking about uh, what you're working on and getting feedback from your peers. Um, we want to be able to create more opportunities to do that. We know it's been a, a tough few years with the the, the pandemic and and uh, you know not necessarily having the chance to bump into as many new perspectives and, and have great conversations about your work as you would have in in different times. So um, you know starting virtually and transitioning to, to in person, we want to create more and more of these opportunities. So we have a coffee social coming up uh, on February second, uh, just a couple of days from now. We'd love to see you there. Uh, it's just meant to be an informal chance to chat with other people and uh, uh, have a chance to win some great coffee related prizes. Um, and then we also have an upcoming professional development session with an Amy alum, uh, Corey Mathewson. So uh, Corey's gonna be uh, sharing some advice and some experience around um, internships, scholarships, mentorship and entrepreneurship uh, and giving you some, some different channels to gain other experiences uh, as you grow into uh, the next stages of your career. And we also have an open job opportunity to share with you. So if you're interested in applying to work with us here at Amy, we have a machine learning project manager position with our advanced technology team. Uh, you get to work with an incredible group of scientists and, and researchers. Uh, so this posting is currently open. Um, if you're interested, please uh, click through and, uh, and apply there. Uh, we'll share the links to uh, register for some of these in the Remo, just following this as well. And um, I do want to take a quick moment to say, um, if you haven't already, which most of you, in order to be here, you, you should probably have registered for our talent pipeline, but for your peers, your lab mates, and uh, your friends that might be interested in exploring careers in AI, um, please uh, share this link with them, encourage them to, to join our community, take advantage of sessions like this, and grow with us moving forward. We have some really great opportunities internships and, and full-time roles like that, but also some new work integrated learning opportunities where you can get paid to work hand in hand with our Amy product teams uh, with industry on all types of exciting projects and, uh, and applications. So uh, stay tuned for, for more on that. And we really appreciate your feedback. We wanna bring you more great content uh, like this panel conversation today. Uh, and so if, if you can just click through, uh, we'll share a link in the Remo as well, but um, for those of us getting used to QR codes again from the past couple of years, uh, we have a QR code here for you as well. We'd love it if you just take a quick moment and uh, share your, your feedback with us. Uh, we'd truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. We are gonna shut down the presentation for now and just jump into Remo uh, uh, for a little while longer. You'll have a chance to, to chat with other people here. Uh, I know some of our, uh, our uh, Panelists will not be able to join us, unfortunately, today, but we look forward to, to having them out at a, a coffee social down the road. So um, thanks again, and we will talk to you in a moment here. All the best.